The chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Mrs. Charlotte Osei, confirms an oversight of 2.5 million Ghana cities being money generated from the replacement of voter ID cards. Dr. Mahmoud Baumia has paid a visit to the family who lost a woman whose car was washed away by floods. And Ghana and Malta resolve to strengthen their long-standing relationship for their mutual benefit. Good evening and welcome to News Hour live on GBC 24 and Ghana Television. My name is Emmanuel Amagashi. And my name is Evans H. Champon. Now to our very first story. Ghana and Malta have resolved to strengthen their long-standing relationship for their mutual benefits. And Ghana is seeking Malta's support for her candidature to the United Nations Security Council as non-permanent member in 2020, while Malta needs Ghana's assistance to be elected as a member of the Council of International Maritime Organization. Edward Nyako reports. Ghana prides itself as a gateway to the ECOWAS sub-region, while Malta also describes herself as a natural gateway to North Africa and Europe. Located in the heart of the Mediterranean, Malta is for the first time opening her doors to countries south of the Sahara to do business with. And to the Maltese, the best place to kickstart the adventure to Africa is Ghana. On the other hand, Ghana is one of the few countries that has opened her embassy in Malta. So they're coming together of the two gateway nations in Ghana's presidency to deliberate on economic, social, and migration issues marks a turning point in the history of both countries. President Kufuadu and his Maltese counterpart, Marie-Louis Colero Preka, had a roundtable discussion. We began the process of reviving our agriculture, reviving our industrial activity, and believe that out of this we're going to be able to develop the the platform for dealing with what is the biggest problem confronting our nation the employment of our youth unemployment is ripe especially amongst the young people of our country and we think that if we can create the conditions for them to employ all of this energy and enterprise and that is spent in trying to cross the Sahara and getting involved in these uh, harrowing adventures in the Mediterranean. They could provide a major source of energy and uh, impulse to the development of our economy. We come here with determination to transform our existing strong diplomatic relations into fruitful, effective, tangible, collaborations in many areas, trade, investment, education, tourism. Well, I can continue and continue because uh, we do believe that Malta and Ghana are ideally situated as hubs in our respective regions. Afterwards, the two leaders met the press to brief them about what transpired during their discussion on the economy, job creation, supporting candidates vying for international positions and migration topping the agenda. For instance, the president of Malta and her team resolved to give that voice to Ghana's cause and interest in the European Union. We, on the other hand, will also help to facilitate the provision of a platform for enhanced economic engagement between Malta and the member countries of ECOWAS. This should boost the trade volumes and help bring prosperity to our two people. It was also agreed that Ghana and Malta extend support to candidates from our respective countries vying for positions in international organizations. Ghana has therefore given support to Malta's bid for membership of the Council of the International Maritime Organization, IMO, elections, which take place later this year. Malta, on the other hand, has agreed to support Ghana's bid for a non-permanent seat of the UN Security Council from 2020 to 2021. The Memorandum of Understanding between Trade Malta and the Association of Ghanaian Industries and the Memorandum of Understanding and Cooperation between the Guyan 
Chamber of Commerce and the Multi Chamber of Commerce, Enterprise and Industry, which will be signed tomorrow at the end of the Business Forum, will be a strong statement of mutual commitment to encourage and develop effective collaborations, potential partnerships, and future business. Furthermore, Malta is keen to continue the necessary discussions for the completion and eventual signing of other agreements between the two countries, such as the double taxation agreement, which will effectively open opportunities for mutual business. To affirm the tie between Ghana and Malta, a memorandum of understanding was signed. President Maui Louis Kolewe Preka and his team for Malta will on Thursday travel to Kumasi to pay courtesy call on the Asante Hin and visit the hospital, the Hope Exchange, built with the support of the people of Malta. Edward Nyakun reporting for GBC24. Until at the Flagstaff House, the President Akufo, President Akufo Ado has referred a petition signed by 17 persons seeking to impeach the chairperson of the Electoral Commission to the Chief Justice for resolution. According to the Director of Communication at the Flagstaff House, Mr. Eugene Ahin, this is in accordance with the provisions of Article 146, Paragraph 3 of the Constitution. Around 12 o'clock this afternoon, um, the President referred the petition that had been brought to him by the concerned staff of the Electoral Commission who are demanding for the removal of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Madame Charlotte Osei, to the Chief Justice. Now, you know this matter is purely a constitutional one, so in accordance with Article 1463 of the Constitution, when such a matter is put before the President, i.e. with regards to the removal of a Justice of a Superior Court or the removal of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, the President has no choice but to forward the petition to the Chief Justice who would, if she decides there's a prima facie case against the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, is supposed to form a committee who would also look into the matter, make recommendations to her, and then subsequently the Chief Justice forwards those recommendations to the President for action. There are names attached. Initially, when the petition was brought, it was, as I said in my statement, it was signed and it was undated. And the names of the petitioners were, 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 not, were not present. But I think on the 20th of July, the counsel for the petitioners furnished the presidency with the names of 17 people who have petitioned for the removal of the chairperson of the Electoral Commission. Meanwhile, the chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Mrs. Charlotte Osei, met the committee on the whole of parliament today. He told the House that the 2017 budget failed to capture 2.5 million Ghana cities, being money generated from the replacement of voter ID cards as an oversight on her part. She, however, said the money is in an account at the GCB bank. According to the Electoral Commissioner, Mrs. Charlotte Osei, the EC received 4,271 applications from media houses and charged a fee of 10 Ghana cities per person. On the other hand, 273 additional journalists were accredited without charge, which gave them access to the National Coalition Center. In total, from media houses, we collected 42,710 Ghana cities. In total, for media accreditation and the NCC, we paid to the printer 42,713 Ghana cities, 60 pesos. The EC chair said the replacement card was done at a fee of five Ghana cities and the monies generated were paid into an account at the Ghana Commercial Bank to avoid misappropriation of funds. For the duration up to the 24th of July 2017, we have collected 2590080.47. Members further questioned why the monies were not recorded in the EC's financial statement submitted to the government. Mr. Chair, it must have been an oversight. 
I would have to talk to the director of finance or the deputy chair of finance who prepared it. When was that discovery made? The discovery of that amount sitting in the account. When, when was it made? Mr. Chair, when I got the letter from Parliament inviting me to come and speak to how much we had collected for lost um, or replaced ID cards, then we, asked, we requested a bank statement. And that's what I found in the bank statement is what I've come to report to the House. We made the discovery just when, when the House asked her to come and answer. Asked, that's when she discovered that this was the Otherwise, we're not going to... We are not going to discover that there are any, any such amounts of you know. Mr. Chair, I'm not the entire commission. There are other people who work on these things. I'm speaking for myself as chair. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, that is, that is very informative. Please, let me explain. The chairman, can I explain? The chairman, the chairman, the chairman. 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 The there are other people who work within the department on this every day, so it's not a discovery matter, so to speak. They must know what is being paid into the account and what is happening there. So when you said it was an oversight, when you said it was an oversight, were you speaking for those of them who who won't cover that or for yourself? myself because I have not spoken to them yet. If you allow me, I'll then engage the technical staff to prepare the budget and find out exactly what happened. The Member of Parliament for North Tong, Mr. Samuel Okujeto Ablakwa, asked if the government would in the future bear the cost of journalists covering elections. It's something the Commission would have to look at. I don't think that I should speak when the Commission has not considered it. The end of the session was nearly mad and there was a hold up. The minority in parliament fears the country may be plunged into darkness or doom so again if government rescinds or abrogates the Ameri deal. Their concerns comes ahead of a move by, a member, by the Member of Parliament for Adansia Sukwa, Mr. Katie Hammond, to table an urgent motion requesting the House to rescind its decision on the deal approved by the Sith Parliament. The Ameri deal was reached in 2015 where the government rented a 300 megawatts of emergency power to augment power during the crisis. The contract between the government of Ghana and Africa and Middle East Resources Investment Group was on the terms of build, own, operate and transfer agreement. We would want to know the official government position on the matter as the contract is in force and the matter if even parliament took a decision will have consequence on our energy generation and matters relating to doom so is coming back and otherwise another economic consequence of uh, paying back and compensating for investment relative to the operation of the contract the member of parliament for adansia sokwa mr katie hammond said his call for parliament to rescind its decision was in the interest of the state. Parliament approved it for its legality. Parliament is now being challenged by a member of parliament that the legality uh, which we ascribed to that uh, agreement, which we gave to that agreement, is suspect. When the bill was brought before the House in 2015, Mr. Katie Hammond supported it, but some members expressed concern about his sudden turnaround. If you are to abrogate a contract, it comes with its own consequences. Possible breaches of contract, possible judgment debt, which is a charge to the consolidated fund. So if you are asking government, if you are, if as a member of parliament, contrary to Article 108, 
you are bringing a motion that seeks to impose a charge on the consolidated fund is illegal. It's unconstitutional. We contracted some agreement with some people. They are charging us about 200 pounds, 200 cities, 200 dollars, whatever. I'm asking that they reduce it to 50 dollars, to 50 cities. Is that, is that a difficulty? Is that, is, is that a difficulty? The recession and asking them to renegotiate. The Ameri deal cost $510 million, in which Ameri was to build the power plants, operate them for five years before transferring them to the government of Ghana. And the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Bawamia, toured the northern region after torrential rains wrecked havoc and claimed four lives. At Sunaili, the Vice President visited the family of a woman whose car was washed away by the floods. He donated 5,000 Ghana cities to the bereaved family. The Vice President also taught some flood-prone areas of the Tamale metropolis. The NADMO coordinator, Alaji Abdullahi Hindu, said some buildings are on waterways impeding free flow of water. The Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection, Madam Otiko Afisa Jaba, has appealed to Ghanaians to end child marriage. She said child marriage is illegal in Ghana and parents who lure their children into such marriages will be committing an offence. The sector minister made the appeal at the launch of a campaign to end child marriages in the Tamale. In the no child marriage is a human rights violation. Despite laws against it, the practice remains widespread in some parts of the world, largely due to persistent poverty and gender inequality. It is a forced marriage because children at that age do not have the capacity to make free and informed decisions about the marriage. In recent times, majority of recorded child marriage cases show that the girls are actually being married to boys who are slightly older. The global statistics according to data released by UNICEF in July 2014 indicates that each year, 15 million girls marry before their 18th birthday. The research also indicates that more than 700 million women alive today were married before the age of 18, while 33 million were married before the age of 15. At the launch of the End Child Marriage Campaign, organized by World Vision in conjunction with the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection, the Northern Regional Minister, Salifu Said, said parents should take the responsibility of nurturing their female child to become adults before marriage. Violence against child or children derails the potential and development of children and consequently contribute negatively to the national development. The chairperson of the World Vision expressed concern about the menace of child marriage in the northern region. Support for vulnerable families through livelihood and resilience programs such as Savings Group catalyze faith leaders and faith communities to end child marriage. Empower communities through awareness and community conversations to take action to end child marriage and harmful practices, among others. The Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection, Madame Otiko Afisa Jaba, said there must be an end to child marriage, adding that it is illegal to marry a child. I pledge my unwavering support to this campaign. I call on all stakeholders traditional leaders, parents, religious leaders, politicians, men and women, NGOs, development partners, and the girls themselves to support this campaign to save our future. We must secure today for tomorrow. We must stop paying lip service to our children and we must walk the talk. You're watching News Hour live on GBC 24 and Ghana Television. In other news, the Abeka Magistrate Court has again adjourned the judgment of the case involving the Mawako Lebanese supervisor, Jihad Chaban, and former employee Evelyn Boache, the 2nd August 2017. The magistrate, Victoria Efwa Kwanza, said the inability of the court to deliver judgment is based on new development before it.
The lawyer for the accused, Dr. Julio Di Medero, has filed an application for out-of-court settlement. Mr. Di Medero said they have had a number of meetings with the complainant and have agreed on terms of the settlement. The presiding magistrate, Victoria Kwanza, told the court that she had to study the terms of the settlement alongside the court's decision. She indicated that the criminal aspect of the case still holds and would go ahead and give judgment on it. Mr. Jihad Chaban in February 2017 was alleged to have dipped the face of Miss Evelyn Boache, then an employee of Mawako restaurant, in blended pepper and calling her names for fidgeting with a blender. The accused person was on trial for three charges, offensive conduct, assault, and causing harm. And an appeals court in Accra has dismissed an application for stay of execution filed by suspended human rights lawyer Mr. Francis Xavier Susu for lack of jurisdiction to hear the matter. The Court of Appeal was presided over by Justice Henry Kofi. In his ruling, Justice Kofi explained that the appeals court cannot adjudicate the application of lawyer Susu, which was seeking to have the General Legal Counsel GLC's three-year ban of lawyer Susu looked at. According to the court, lawyer Susu should have filed his application at the registry of the GLC for the document to be conveyed to the Court of Appeals before appearing before it. Lawyer Susu was convicted on his own plea of guilty on the charges of touting and overestimation of fees by the General Legal Counsel in June 2017. Counsel for the embattled lawyer in previous court appearances argued that the suspension by the General Legal Counsel is harsh and disproportionate. According to him, his client was wrongly charged with grave professional misconduct which is not defined in the law and therefore both charges cannot hold. He argues that the Legal Vocation Act only refers to professional misconduct and claimed the sentence imposed on his client is high-handed. Meanwhile, lawyer Francis Sosu, who intends to appeal again, told the media he believes justice will eventually be served. You know, it is often said that the wheels of justice grind slowly, but surely, you know, you would get there. Um, I have no doubt whatsoever uh, what uh, God will do at the end of the day. I believe that at the end of the day, this whole story will be written in gold. Now the demand for hybrid cocoa seedlings in cocoa farming communities in the eastern region is on the increase. Some of the farmers say the introduction of the hybrid cocoa seed seedlings and the training of cocoa farmers on good agricultural practices have increased yields and profits. And this they believe would increase cocoa production in Ghana to exceed Cocoa Board's target of 1 million tons. Cocoa is the chief agricultural export of Ghana and the country's main cash crop. Ghana is the second largest cocoa exporter in the world after Ivory Coast. Ghana's cocoa produces some of the world's best chocolate. The cocoa crop has a long history in Ghana. In 1878, a trader named Tetakwashi returned home from Fernando Po, now Biako in Equatorial Guinea with cacao seeds of the highly uniform West African Amelonado variety which were planted in the Akriapa Mountains of the Eastern Region. There were further introductions between 1900 and 1909 from Jamaica, Trinidad and Venezuela. The new industry grew rapidly across the country and in 1910, Ghana became the world's leading cocoa producer accounting for 30 to 40 percent of the global market. These old variety of cocoa seeds usually take four years and over to mature when governments realized that farming methods were outdated and inefficient. It decided to work hand in hand with stakeholders in the cocoa sector to strategize on how to produce cocoa seedlings and improve agronomic practices that can produce cocoa trees that will bear fruits early. 
This led to the introduction of the new hybrid varieties, popularly known in the eastern region as Abrewabedi or Akokrabedi. The hybrid cocoa seed, which is an improvement on the old variety, has the capacity to produce 2,000 cocoa buds per tree, as compared to 350 buds produced by the old cocoa variety. Abrewabedi or Akokrabedi has a maturity time of two to two and a half years. Cocoa Board distributed them free of charge to some farming communities. Up till now, some cocoa farmers in 447 cocoa farming communities under the Cocoa Life program still receive free hybrid cocoa seeds and training on good agricultural practices to boost cocoa production. Within a year, eight months, the trees already start bearing fruits. And by three years, you have a full stock on the trees, which is good. And then the climate conditions to uh, the trees are able to withstand the climate conditions. So in a way, it brings improvement to the farmers. It also brings improvement in the community. Some farms in the eastern region were used as experimental farms to examine the efficacy of the new hybrid cocoa seed. Some of the farmers were reluctant to agree on using their farms for experiment. Those who agreed said they have not regretted at all. First, I have uh, two bags of cocoa from an acre. With the introduction of the new techniques, I'm now harvesting even more than eight bags per acre. Sometimes when, when we have an adequate rainfall, the yield increases, but oh, if the rainfall pattern is not all that good, it decreases, but not like the first. The hybrid uh, seedling, some of the pots are on the tree. So it is very good than the Metekwashi both. Madame Mary Asiedua is a cocoa farmer who regrets she did not allow her farm to be used as one of the experimental farms for the hybrid cocoa seed production. I realized if I allow them to use my farm for the experiment, it will benefit my family and I. That's why I have allowed them to use mine now, and I know I'll benefit from it. Currently, the country has only one of the three global facilities in Tafo in the eastern region, serving five of the six cocoa growing regions under the Cocoa Life Project, which seeks to provide farmers with improved and quality cocoa seedlings. When the farmers got to know the survivability of our seedlings, the demand shot up. The demand from a Sunafunov alone was 2 million seedlings. West Achim demanded 1.2 million seedlings. Wasa East, they demanded 1.5 million seedlings. Uh, Asaman Kese, they demanded 1.2 million seedlings. So the demand is high. According to the cocoa farmers, they requested 2.3 million seedlings from Tree Global for planting but the company could not meet the demand because of the limited facility located in Tafo. They therefore called on the government to invest in three global facilities since it has the capacity of producing yields in two to three years compared to the traditional yields of four to eight years. Now, a 19-year-old girl from Awuma, a village near Bodada in the Jasikan district of the Volta region, has given birth to quadruplets. All the four babies are girls and she is appealing for help. Awuma, a village near Bodada, the traditional seat of the people of Jasikan, is located within the Ekiapim range in the Volta region. It is a predominantly farming community. The 19-year-old mother of the quadruplets Amina Maju is married to 20-year-old Razak Adamu, a farmer and resident of Awoma. Amina delivered at the Rara Government Hospital after being referred from the Jasikan District Hospital. All the four babies are girls and very healthy. Although Amina says she is happy to have given birth to quadruplets since they are special gifts from God, her worry is how to cater for them as a family is not financially sound. Miss Patience Agbevo, a public health nurse at the Bodada Health Centre, regularly visits Amina and her three-weeks-old babies at home to provide postnatal care. Amina's aunt, Madame Kozi, appealed to Ghanaians to support in the upkeep of the four babies.
return with business after this break. Don't go away. Come to business. The Public Procurement Authority has been duly appointed regional ministers. Chief executives of MMDAs and heads of state agencies on the amended Public Procurement Act at Akrade. The participants were educated on sole sourcing, restricted tender approval processes, and how to provide technical advice on government contracts to obtain value for money. Participants at the training were taken through the approval threshold categories, procurement methods, single source procurement, restricted tendering, offenses, sanctions and procurement plans. The Chief Executive of the Public Procurement Authority, Mr. Ajenim Boateng said the Public Procurement Act was promulgated to ensure transparency and check corruption in the public sector. He said the authority has established two operational units to enhance the credibility of its operations and processes. With support from the e-transform project, the World Bank will soon pilot an electronic government procurement system in six institutions, including Cocoa Board, Ghana Health Service, Kofodia Technical University, Volta River Authority, and the Department of FIDA Roads. The PPA's new vision is that we have investigative powers under the law. When you go to Access 9 in Section 89 and Section 90, the Public Procurement Authority has powers to conduct investigation into any procurement activity of any public institution. That is what the new phase of PPA is going to address itself. The Deputy Western Regional Minister, Madam Eugenia Kusi, asked the appointees to work under the provisions of the procurement law. The District Chief Executive of Inzima East, Mr. Frank Openin, and the DCE for Siaman, Mr. Christian Barr, were optimistic that the Procurement Act will guide them to work to protect the public purse. It will help us to do the right thing, not to do anything contrary to the Act, and then we'll find ourselves wanting. There are certain things I have learned that I'm supposed to do as a District Chief Executive. I don't have to cross certain thresholds, so I know them now. So I'm sure we should go by those thresholds you know, to avoid or to, in order not to attract queries to ourselves. The Ghana Institute of Surveyors says to rebrand its activities to meet international standards. The Institute hopes to raise one million Ghana cities to achieve this objective. A fundraising ceremony has been held in Accra to solicit support from its partners. The Ghana Institute of Surveyors was established as the leading source of professional advice on landed property and construction in Ghana. The institute has over the years tried to educate the public on matters relating to land, property and construction. It is also initiating measures to raise ethical standards in the survey profession. To achieve these objectives, the institute hopes to raise one million Ghana cities to rebrand its activities to meet international standards. The president of the Ghana Institute of Surveyors, Mr. Edwin Adoteria, said the fundraising will help the institute to address its challenges. For us to undertake our capital expenditure, we need to raise these funds to complete our secretariat. The internal structures need to be fixed. We also need to run the capacity building for our members uh, to really educate them on how to respond to customer care. So we need to undertake a lot of seminars to call our members to come and attend, to learn our way of providing services at the right time, at the right quality, and then at the minimum cost. The past president of the Ghana Institute of Surveyors, Mr. James Ebenezer Corbina Datsun, said land is limited and therefore Galamse and its related distraction to forest reserves must be halted. It calls for commitment on the part of everybody and it also calls for awareness. There are people who are engaged in some of these activities that do not know that they are hurting the environment. We have to create that awareness and also ensure that everybody helps in policing this land resource that we have. We cannot increase the size of our land. We cannot move away from this country and go and set up Ghana in, in any other country. So we have to make sure that we protect what we have. About 6,000 Ghana cities have so far been realized. The Institute says it is expecting further support from its partners.
And Access Bank Ghana currently has over 30 billion Ghana cities in loans and advances. The managing director of the bank, Mr. Dolapo Ogundimu, said the figure increased to 20.2% from the 11.4% recorded same period last year. He said this when Access Bank Ghana took its turn at the fact behind the figure series in Accra. Ghana currently has about 36 banks and Access Bank is one of the leading banks. The bank currently has over 51 branches and 84 ATMs nationwide. It also has a workforce of 1,200. The managing director of the bank, Mr. Dolapo Ogundimu, said the bank is working to reduce its non-performing loans ratio to about 5%. The banks don't live on interest income alone. There's a lot of transactional income and there are a lot of other opportunities for banks to make money. The income lines after interest, they call commissions and fees. That list is very, very long. And for each line, we tend to exploit each one of them, as long as we are giving the value and service to the customer. He said the bank currently has a debt portfolio of 150 million Ghana cities as a result of the debt audit by Bulk Oil Distributing Company. If banks have to fund all the public sector money, Definitely, it will reduce the availability of money for credit to the private sector. That's one. Secondly, um, there is still a lot of standing in terms of, let's say, energy related debts that is still being unpaid. And all those ones are part of what is constricting liquidity in the market. Mr. Dolapo Ogundimu said the bank will strengthen its digital banking services to reduce the presence of brick and mortar banking where customers have to visit the banking hall to be served. This, he said, will bring banking closer to its customers. That'll be all for business. The health news is up next. In health news, over 200 students from various tertiary institutions have been inducted into the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana. Speaking at the ceremony, the Deputy Minister for Health, Madam Tina Mensa, echoed the need for health professionals to ensure quality health care for their clientele. The Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana groups over 4,000 professional pharmacists. The society was established on the 19th of October 1957 to supervise pharmaceutical services at all times. At this year's induction ceremony, 218 students were co-opted into the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana, with 109 from the KNUST Central University providing 72, 29 from the University of Ghana, and 8 others from the diaspora. The gender ratio of the new graduates was almost a tie, 144 males and 137 females. A clear indication that females are becoming more audacious, trying academic fields previously male-dominated. Stakeholders from the Pharmaceutical Society charged the new inductees to discharge their duties with integrity, humility and professionalism. The president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Ghana, Mr. Thomas Boatina PJ urged them to continually develop their competences and acumen to be relevant in the rather competitive job space. You are entering one of the most difficult, diverse, and demanding professions in the entire world. There is no place for slightness or laziness. You must work hard, sometimes work long hours. Sometimes work all hours, and you must do so with passion and deliver excellence at every opportunity. He further encouraged them to uphold strong values to be able to distinguish right from wrong. The Deputy Minister for Health, Madam Tina Mensa, called on stakeholders in the health sector to act in concert to ensure that challenges hindering the advancement of the pharmaceutical sector are managed. The ministry has instructed the pharmacy council to design process to identify ineffective workflows, structures, or system and to redesign them to fit current business needs. The developed plan to implement the new changes. This goes a strong sense of commitment in mobilizing the human capital 
for advancement of pharmaceutical care in Ghana. The inducted pharmacists swore the apothecary oath. This oath commits them to their professional ethos, ensuring that the greatest premium is placed on lives in their line of duty. To devote my working life to the service of mankind. Now, the food one eats when pregnant is very important for the health of the mother and the unborn child, especially during the first trimester. However, most pregnant women are not consuming nearly enough for it. This has been linked with an increased risk of defects in low birth weight and growth. The health desk takes a look at what pregnant women should eat. Maintaining a healthy diet during pregnancy is very important. During this time, the body needs additional nutrients, vitamins and minerals. One may need 350 to 500 extra calories each day during the second and third trimesters of the pregnancy. A diet that lacks key nutrients may negatively affect the body's development, while poor eating habits and excess weight gain may also increase the risk of gestational diabetes and pregnancy or birth complications. You will probably be more hungry than usual, but experts say the idea of eating for two is a myth. Experts advise the intake of more fruits and vegetables. These provide vitamins and minerals as well as fiber. Starchy carbs like bread and pasta, these should make up a third of the food you eat. Eat some protein, such as meat, beans, fish or eggs every day, and it should be well cooked. Dairy products, milk, is important because it contains calcium and other nutrients your body needs. Vegetarian and vegan moms-to-be should make sure they get enough iron calcium and vitamins B12 and D. However, foods like cheese, sharks, swordfish or mullein, raw shellfish and ant and pasteurized milk should be avoided. There is no need for extra calories in the first six months of pregnancy. Pregnant women only need to eat more in the last three months even if you are expecting twins or triplets. And that was the health segment. Let's go beyond our borders now and do some foreign stories. Africa's oldest nation, Liberia, chalks 170 years. Today, she obtained sovereign rule after America left the scene in 1847. Liberia made a U-turn from a prolonged period of instability when a civil war broke out in 1990. The war officially came to an end when Mr. Charles Taylor, the main warlord, assumed the reins of government in 2003. A Liberian refugee in Ghana, Mr. Tony Sawyer, shares some of his experiences about the war and its aftermath. He spoke to Napoleon Atu Kito. Liberia in view once again as the West African nation marks 170 years of nationhood, an entity whose very existence was nearly shattered by a protracted civil war which began in 1990. Army Sergeant Samuel Canyon Doe had ruled Liberia 10 years and the overarching quest to remove him resulted in one of Africa's most unspeakable mayhems. It was a civil war that lasted for more than two decades before an audacious move settled the issue. That brought the leader of the National Patriotic Front of Liberia, Mr. Charles Taylor, to power under a force majeure. Until then, the war in Liberia had crippled the country as she wobbled on power vacuum, economic stagnation, war atrocities and humanitarian crisis. Characters in the war theater were the then beleaguered head of state, Sergeant Samuel Doe, Mr. Charles Taylor, Mr. Prince Yomi Johnson, who parted with Taylor to form the Independent Patriotic Front of Liberia, and Dr. Amos Sawyer, the academic noted for his diplomatic skill. As Liberia turns 170, one of her prominent citizens who became a refugee in Ghana shares his experiences with the desk news of GBC24. As a former government official during the Talbot regime, and the war has brought me in Ghana 
displace me and my family, and not only me, but other prominent Liberians, doctors, engineers, lawyers, been displaced, and we find ourselves in Ghana. Mr. Tony Sawyer lost his job after the 1980 coup of Sergeant Doe, but was reinstated, rising to become an acting deputy minister of agriculture before the civil war broke out. He left Liberia for Ghana in 1990. He says the late Sergeant Doe, who was killed by forces loyal to Prince Johnson, had intimated to leave the scene in 1981, but the political forces disbelieved him, thinking he might renege on his word. If Samuel K. Doe had not been stubborn, you see, and by clicking into the seat, the civil war could not have come. But Samuel Kedo too contributed in the civil war. But actually Prince Johnson and uh, Charles Taylor made us to be what we are today. It's because Samuel Kedo said, let there be an election and give me the end of this year, then I will become, I, I will step down. If Taylor and uh, Prince Johnson have agreed on that, I don't think, that's my view, I don't think there could have been a war. He spoke about harrowing incidents at the height of the Liberian Civil War. A family was killed at a security checkpoint while a pregnant woman had a belly split open. Trials in the story. We take a break here. We we'll back shortly with sports. Samba. The Ministry of Youth and Sports is hopeful of securing a partnership with the government of Malta to fund the development of sports in the country. The sector minister, Mr. Isaac Isiama, says Ghana can benefit from Malta's expertise in water sports to develop sports such as swimming as well as canoeing and rowing. The visit by the first gentleman of Malta, His Excellency Edgar Preka, was to interact with the sector minister and his officials and heads of sports associations in Ghana. Mr. Edgar Preka, a lover of sports, hinted that sports is a vital tool for uniting nations and providing employment for people from all walks of life. I um, urge you to continue to do our best so that we live a better world for our young generation. The sector minister, Mr. Isaac Isiama, called for a relationship that will benefit the interest of both countries in terms of sports infrastructure. Water sports, golf, and other disciplines. My request is that we need to have, have a relationship that will best serve both countries, our interests in terms of sports infrastructure. Also present during the interaction were boxing legend Azuma Nelson and some members of the Professional Footballers Association of Ghana, including its General Secretary, Mr. Tony Bafo, Black Stars Assistant Coach, Ibrahim Tanko, Mr. Augustine Ahimfo, Businessman, Mr. Kennedy and Japan, and the Ghana Shooting Association President, Mr. Kelly. Let's still stay at the corridors of the Ministry of Youth and Sports and the National Cycling Team. The Golden Pedals have received thumbs up from the Minister for Youth and Sports, Mr. Isaac Isiama. The team emerged the overall winners in the just and the Tour de la Leste international competition, which ended in Côte d'Ivoire at the weekend. The Golden Pedals made history in the competition when a Ghanaian won the yellow jersey for the first time in the international competition, which began in 1986. Anthony Boache from the River Park Cycling Club made an overall time of 18 hours, 49 minutes and 38 seconds ahead of Ivorian Cabre Daniels in 18 hours, 51 minutes and 00 seconds. The cycling competition covered a distance of about 766.8 kilometers. 
Boache led the Ghanaian team to make a time difference of 1 minute and 22 seconds to place first. He also won the best young cyclist with a time of 18 hours, 49 minutes and 38 seconds. Some officials and cyclists shared their experiences. We like them to uh, keep motivating us so that we can bring more trophies to our motherland Ghana. I felt very, very happy because we've been training really hard for such opportunity. And when it happens to you, it was like a glorious from God to the team. Um, I cannot describe how happy we were because, you know, when we got to the tournament, we were not being seen as any team that would come there and pick the yellow jersey and the, the best team itself. But then, of course, we went there, and I would say the secret that gave us this thing was the teamwork. There was so much unity in our team. The boys were there, and with pet talks from their coaches, their mechanics, and myself, we kept going, we kept going, we kept going, we kept going, and ultimately, we realized that there was the opportunity to pick the yellow jersey. Then we went for it, and then we had it. The duo of Kusi Clement and Iwuku Frank came in third and fourth. They returned with six trophies and a cash prize. Finally, the Premier League board, PLB, has suspended the National League for a month. The move is to pave way for the MTN FA Cup as well as allow Black Stars B team to prepare for the upcoming Chan qualifiers with Burkina Faso. So we have a, a big... The Ghana Premier League is on a one-month break to allow for the quarterfinals of the MTN FA Cup to be on it as well as pave way for handlers of the local Black Stars to prepare adequately for the 2018 Calf Chan qualifiers against Burkina Faso. The quarterfinals of the MTN FA Cup will be on it this weekend and Team Ghana, which is made up of players from the domestic league, will commence a one-week residential campaign ahead of their big two leg qualifiers with Burkina Faso, which will be played over a two-week period in August. The Premier League returns with March Day 25 and March Day 26 on August 27th and August 30. It will again break for three weeks in September to allow the Black Stars prepare and participate in the 2017 Wafu Tournament. The PLB says all outstanding matches, including matches involving Asante Kotoko, will be cleared within the one-month period. A second medical review of Asante Kotoko on Tuesday, July 25, 2017 reveals that Kotoko players who were involved in a motor accident will be cleared to play by August 6, 2017. Sunday, July 30, 2017, we'll see Ash Gold taking on Wafa in Obwase. Sunday, August 6, 2017, we'll see Asante Kotoko facing Accra Hatsi Folk in Kumasi. And Wednesday, August 23, 2017, we'll see Wafa taking on Kumasi Asante Kotoko. In Sugar Kope. That's all for sports entertainment is next. Good evening. This segment is brought to you by Cowbell. My name is Valerie Danso. The National Dance Ensemble has staged an African dance theater spectacle titled Musu Saga of the Slaves. It is a play that tells a tale about slavery during the colonial era. <laughs> Musu in the Ga and Akan languages of Ghana means abomination. These dances demonstrate some aspects of the transatlantic slave trade. Musu is inspired by certain incidents which occurred during the period of slave trade. The play shows how Ghanaians were deceived by the British. They were maltreated for the land's rich minerals such as gold, diamond, among others. The play is in commemoration with this year's Pan-African Festival celebration. The play was directed by Ni Tete Yate and Monty Thompson.
that's all in the segment. Have a good evening.